Signal Sciences secures the most important web applications, APIs, and microservices of the world's leading companies, protecting over 7,500 applications and 150 billion production requests per week. Signal Sciences NextGen WAF and RASP help companies increase security and maintain site reliability without sacrificing velocity, all at the lowest total cost of ownership. Signal Sciences patented technology protects any application against any attack with integrations into any DevOps toolchain. Signal Sciences, demand more from your WAF. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash signal sciences. By connecting to your code repository, Actrix generates a topology across your full stack to reveal risks so that you can harden your architecture. It also scans code for violations against compliance and security standards to enforce best practices. In addition, Actrix develops threat models using vulnerability feeds, IAM privileges, and other data to predict potential breach paths. Learn how easy it is to get started with Acurix at securityweekly.com forward slash Acurix. Discover a simple way to secure your app without the need for a full security team. With trusted software, simply drag and drop your app and let the ML-enabled smart security work. Get it back fully protected within a couple of minutes. With 50 years of security expertise, Erdetto protects over 5 billion devices and applications for some of the world's best known brands. Change the world one app at a time. To download the white paper on how to address endpoint security in mobile apps, visit securityweekly.com forward slash Erdetto. Welcome back to Application Security Weekly. I'm your host, Mike Shima, joined by Matt Alderman and John Kinsella. We're looking for high quality guest suggestions for all of our podcasts to fill our Q3 recording schedule. Submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com slash guests and submitting the form. We review suggestions monthly and we'll reach out to you once reviewed. Join the Security Weekly mailing list and receive your invite to our community Discord server by visiting securityweekly.com slash subscribe and clicking the button to join the list. Uh, the, you'll, you'll want to join the Discord because you can see all of John's excellent GIF uh, techniques. <laughs> and uh, they interact week, a little bit with the guests and the host. Come on. <laughs> uh, the, the important stuff, too, of course. Yes, yes. And I want to say thanks to Judy, too, because she um, she was in our Discord also um, today. And so if you are listening to the live stream, it was a chance to interact with her as well as listen to us uh, talk with her about bug bounties. And um, one uh, article I did want to, to um, pick out here, it's a little bit old, but it was kind of a nice segue into a couple more vulns we're going to talk about, was just a... Um, article a while ago of about uh, Verizon, PayPal, Twitter, uh, that was just kind of extolling how much money they've paid out in bounties. And I always find these kind of articles um, interesting, I'll say, because on the one hand, it's great to see that companies are building you know, positive relationships with the hacking community, obviously paying for vulns that are being found. But also, it's not necessarily, you know, getting to the top of such a list is not exactly something that your security team should necessarily be striving for. Yeah, that's true, right? Because if you're paying out lots of bounties, that means you have a lot of flawed software. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's a little bit about where you're investing. Um, and where a couple companies have been investing, for example, in uh, security is Zoom. So there is a vulnerability that, um, John, I think you highlighted. There was a zero day um, or an unpatched vuln, whatever the, the parlance is for, for such things, in a... Um, in Zoom, and that was topical because it's Zoom, but a little bit buried the lead is that this requires user interaction on a Windows 7 server or, or Windows 7 system. God, I hope no one's running Windows 7 as a server. Yeah, you and I, we're both <laughs> digging into this one. Um, yeah, this, this is, uh, you know, pro Zoom. Um, it's been a long year for those guys. They're, they're looking forward to a holiday at some point. Um, yeah, it, it's another one. It, there was some sort of interesting stuff underneath this, right? Like the, the researcher mm -hmm. didn't disclose it to them. And um, as you said, it, it's not just like we've become so used nowadays to having some of these vulnerabilities where just like people can pop a system without having any type of anybody's help or handholding or, or right. that type of stuff. Um, that as soon as we see something that, oh, a user has to click on something. Oh, oh, my God, that's terrible. But uh, um yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, what was your take on this one? It, it, so, just a couple comments, right? I mean, yeah. it, this applies to Windows 7, which yeah. Microsoft's been trying to end of life and get rid of and get everybody to 
10 or whatever you know version they want them to next or even older operating systems which <laughs> and you know darn well there's stuff older out there than that right and so i mean you got to give zoom a little bit of a break here i think in some respects right i mean they've done a lot of security fixes over the past few months and made a ton yeah. of strides and improvements but they also have you know, the issues of supporting some of these older legacy operating systems that are trying to be end of life. And, and so here comes a zero day that's affecting an older version when they're trying to keep things moving on all the current versions. So, you know, I, I don't blame them too much for this one necessarily, but. Because I mean, that, that's yeah. a really solid point. Think about that. That means Zoom has to have people who still have Windows 7 systems around that like are on hardware that can run Windows 7 and that the QA folks or the test folks are familiar enough with Win 7 to be able to test out things on there. So that, that's a decent chunk of resources to support something that, you know, hopefully not more than 50 people are running. But, um, yeah, it, but there it's, are. where do you draw that line? <laughs> oh, I, I know, I know. <laughs> There are, yeah, and I think th what, you, what, what you're both describing are just good ways of saying what is our actual, on the one hand, from the security perspective, what's our actual threat model here? Like, what are we really worried about? And what's the, the, the population of systems at risk? And even from that engineering perspective, how much should we be supporting this, what is literally a EOL software? And we've seen this, for example, in the past with either other versions of uh, Android, older versions of iOS for that matter, to be a little bit fair to, to, um, to the mobile space, but also too just in getting rid of older browser support. Um, as a lot of back in 2014, 15, when Google and others were trying to push out, get rid of SHA-1 certs. Um, so there's a lot of this, how to deal with technical debt, and I'm, I'm giving a little bit of foreshadowing for another article we're gonna to get to later. Um, so there's a good conversation here. There's also another vulnerability that came up also in Windows this time um, that, John, you've been also keeping an eye out for uh, DLL hijacking looks to be one of the um, areas of interest to you. And, and this one was actually a um, DLL hijacking in the OneDrive client from Microsoft. Yeah. Um, scrolling through my notes. I know it's in here somewhere. Uh, yeah, it, it's I can't remember how this one hopped on my radar last week. There was one day where we had like a bunch of stuff come out at once. And I think you and I were both scribbling notes for, for uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's another DLL issue, but the interesting one, you know what the common thing we're seeing about these DLL guys um, is that it's usually not directly with the application itself, right? They've linked their, they've linked to, or they've added support for some third party that um, when they do that, then they're adding in a, a, a path, which is, that's where the, it seems like some of these are coming in. So it seems like there's a bit of a code smell there. Um, you and I were going back and forth on this because this one, the the weaknesses actually got to do with the use of Qt. Um, and, you know, at first that made my head whiplash a little bit. Wait, Microsoft is using Qt. And then as you were saying, yeah, that it's because they support more than just Windows, which makes sense. Um, still interesting i think you know I'll, I'll save the rant but i think the one thing i've seen is mm -hmm. as as an organization gets as an organization becomes large in size um i think you realize that there's not really a ton of value in in trying to have a single code base that is multi-platform um I, I think at the end of the day it, it makes more sense just to have two or three separate code bases maybe some level of, of commonality but on the ui side not it i mean look at it goes pretty good but like i was looking at like using can I use Go on an ESP8266 this weekend? Good luck. Um, some wonderful person has got something out there called Python for the browser now. It actually, they've rewritten Python 3 in JavaScript. Um, so there's all sorts of ways you can do this type of thing. Maybe you should pick something that's just native. Um, it is the long comment on that, but um, I don't know. Did I miss anything on the vulnerability itself? <laughs> yeah, I think that was a good point. And I think, too, because it, it highlights for me one of the things we were talking about, even with, um, I think it was two weeks ago, um, we we're talking about, again, DLL hijacking is sort of, yeah. you may know the code you're writing, but what about the security properties of the dependencies you're pulling in? And in this yeah. case, yeah, QT is definitely a surprise. And if you weren't paying attention or if you weren't applying the same, um, you know, DLL search path, you know, testing or security properties to all of those dependencies, then you're going to get, you know, bitten by a bug like this for sure. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, I, mm -hmm. I, Matt's sort of on the edge of saying something there, but um, I'll ask a naive question because I haven't done Windows coding happily in a while. What would be the right way to protect against this? Um, 
I mean, it. I, you can limit your path, but should you be checking for, I'm guessing nowadays, signed DLLs? Um, yeah, I think you have to look at a lot of the code you're bringing in and using and reusing it in this particular case. It's just like with all the open source stuff, right? I mean, how do we know what uh, dependencies I'm pulling into my code without doing some level of view? I think you have to do the same thing with DLLs here is understand what's in some of these dynamic link libraries in order to understand what am I inheriting that I don't maybe know that I'm inheriting to figure out whether I should or shouldn't inherit it, right? It, I think it's a visibility issue, John. Yeah, as much as there is the, the, the you know, checking code signing, checking for signed DLLs, validating that, because I think that was the one that came up um, a few weeks ago that was actually a lack of signing, as much as it was just the, the DLL hell, um, as is, uh, it's been historically called, of where does, um, Win or where does Microsoft or where does Windows look for, you know, what's the search hierarchy of looking for DLLs? Um, and of course, there is, you know, if we're going a little bit uh, really technical, could also just go straight in into static compilation too, um, which has its own trade-offs, but that's another way of just avoiding the, the, the loading arbitrary DLLs as it is. Um, th there is a third vuln that I wanted to highlight this week, and I think part of it I wanted to highlight because as Judy was talking about in our session in the previous segment, is that sure, there's a lot of the OWASP top 10 style vulns that are cross-site scripting, SQL injection, that are, as Matt described, dumping a lot of garbage into an input and then seeing what happens. And that's really easy for automation. That's easy for SAS, easy for DAS to identify. But in this case, um, there's a lot of logic or there's a lot of thinking about abuse of applications or what could happen with an application. In this case, there was an article from Microsoft that was just talking about its focus was on protecting OAuth tokens and SSO and SAML. And it the, its focus was more on protecting your workforce. I wanted to look at that article from the perspective of if you're building an application, that application is compromised and it has OAuth tokens in it, how are you protecting those tokens? Or even something as simple as, do you rotate tokens when you also rotate a user's password? Um, because those are two different ways of those are, you know, a password and a and a token are two different ways into a user's account um, that can often be forgotten. Um, and often those tokens aren't gated on or they're initially gated on uh, 2FA or some type of other strong authentication. But once you have that token, you've got access. So something I, that was the rant that I wanted to pull out for, for today and, to, and focus on uh, threat modeling for that web application. Yeah, this is your content phishing uh, story. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I yep. mean, what's what's interesting here is is you know this ease of use issue where we just want to click a link and gain access, right? But that also creates this this hole, the security hole or potential security hole in this particular article, where because it looks valid and you're just trying to gain, get in, you can actually use it as an attack vector. Think about the early days of Zoom, right? You just clicked the link and you were in, right? And, and that was used uh, as a way to try to bypass certain, certain uh, activity or try to guess what the Zoom link was. Now we added the password to it, which is a hash, which they could probably still do the same enumeration attack if they wanted to, right? Uh, this gets a little more sophisticated, Mike, in that, you know, what they're doing is they're trying to fish uh, the access and then use that as a way to gain a foothold and reuse that token uh, to get into other things, which I think is a very interesting attack. It, but one that's, I think, easily susceptible to, to humans like us who just say, oh, yeah, that looks valid. Click. Boom. I'm in. Yeah, absolutely. And it's one of those things that is, you know, valid access is the best exploit to um, take advantage of, you know, the best vuln to take advantage of. And I think it's Google's, I, what they call it, the advanced security for Gmail. I think part of that is that um, if you opt into that advanced security, they will actually disable this type of OAuth, 
you know, third-party service integration because it does in increase your attack surface. It does introduce that problem that you may have the best protected password, but if you hooked it up to your LinkedIn, someone accesses your LinkedIn account, then that may be a way to leverage that third-party access, or in this case, fish for that access, as the article is highlighting, into that account, independent of what that, um, you know, what your actual username and, what, and password is. Yeah. There was another aspect here or another article here that was also I wanted to highlight in the sense of expanding threat models when you're talking about, you know, going down that route of thinking about logical problems or what, you know, how can applications be abused? In this case, it was um, Firefox. They have a send service, which is essentially a way to um, securely send encrypted files between um, recipients. And in this case, the problem was um, it was being abused. Um, and any time you're dealing with files and any time you are, for example, a site that is dealing with um, uh, images, you know, image uploads, you're starting to get into territory where you actually have to start considering how is my service going to be abused. And this is still, you know, this is, you can call it a trust and safety issue. Often teams have trust and safety that are in charge of these types of things in addition to just security. But, um, you know, abuse images, these types of things are an important aspect of the application. And it also ties into real quick, even when uh, we're talking about Zoom and when Zoom was trying to, was saying whether or not E to E encryption was going to be available for free accounts. One of their reasoning was around how do they minimize the use, mis use or misuse of Zoom for uh, abuse. So I thought this is a really interesting way to talk about something that's not at all a OWASP top 10 type of vulnerability, but still is something actually very important um, for even free services and good services like Firefox send right here. Yeah, I mean, any texting service, right? I mean, yep. you, you, what you're seeing is uh, with all these potential services where you have the ability to send somebody something, a malicious link, a malicious file or whatever, there is an attack path there that has to be accounted for. And, it, it, you know, it's, it's like the previous one a little bit where it's so easy to just link up your Google account to gain access to this other service not realizing it, it's also very easy to click on a file that you think is coming from a trusted source or clicking on a link in your SMS, a viewer that happens to be malicious, right? I mean, these are very interesting attack scenarios and I think are really hard for, for the lay person to really wrap their heads around to say, wait, this, but I know this person, they're not sending me something malicious, but it's been spoofed and boom, next thing you know, they, they have malware or ransomware or whatever running on their device. Yeah, and we're, and we're definitely sort of kind of crossing the line a little bit into enterprise security as well in the sense that, you know, can you detect if, if this phishing campaign is sending encrypted payloads via a service mm -hmm. like this, can you detect that? Or at what point can you detect that? So that's right. definitely on the enterprise security side of things. And of course, on the application security side of things, if you're the, you know, if you are running this service, do you tie into VirusTotal with, you know, uh, you know, files that are uploaded? What are the concerns there? At what point do you encrypt? Do you just encrypt in a purely E to E so you don't have visibility into that? So I think there's definitely still a good conversation to be had in the trade-offs um, from that application security hat on as well. Yeah, and I mean, really the place where this happens on the enterprise side is do you have some sort of endpoint sandboxing technology that can inspect the decrypted file before it gets loaded uh, and, and, and gets loaded or, or installed or whatever. I mean, there's you, you have to have some of that crossover. On the, on the traditional endpoints, it's probably a little easier. You also have to think about this on the mobile devices as well because there's an, a, mobile, a mobile attack path here also in, in some of these attacks. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, for all the bug bounty testers out there, definitely keep focusing on these types of logic or abuse scenarios to see how well applications are hardened. And of course, on that DevSecOps side of thing, pull these into your threat models. Um, Speaking of DevSecOps and DevOps in general, um, John, again, you were highlighting some really interesting articles uh, for, for this week. And there's another one that goes back to the history and the, the derivation, if you will, of tech debt. So uh, introduce us to this particular article. Yeah, this was a, uh, an interesting one. I tend to like these history pieces of time, right? Um, and and, and this, this article, as I, I think, and you made some comments on this too, was a little bit sort of slightly hipster. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, but it, it, this is from uh, Bilchin.com, which is a uh, um, local up in Seattle, relatively speaking, sort of the startup scene up there. But uh, uh, the 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 subject or the the headline on it. Um, stop talking about te te technical debt. And I think in a very narrow window, the point they're trying to get across, I, it makes sense, um, but they're probably being a little too engineering on it. But in, but nonetheless, the article has a bunch of really great stuff and the great links and different things. Um, out to Ward Cunningham, talking on YouTube about what he meant when he first coined the term um, technical debt, uh, which is the idea of not so much that there is broken stuff in your code that you know that you're going to go back and fix at some point in time, but actually he talks about it as taking out a loan so that you can get your product in front of people quicker, get feedback, and then implement that feedback into the product. So that's the type of debt that he's talking about. Um, but, you know, it's it's a little late to go back and, and get people to do the correct thing in history. So that's, you know, we're faced with what we have here now. But, it, you know, it's, it, it's interesting from that point of view, I think, to, to, to read through it. It's not too long. Think about you know, what is technical debt? Why did you let yourself write bad code in the first place or your team or, you know, whatever else you could be lazy. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing because hell, I do it all the time too, right? Um, but what what is that balance? Why are you making that trade-off? And I think that's really the important part is is having that thought or discussion about what is that trade-off you're having? Yeah, and I think yeah, what, what, uh, the monetary ahead. aspects of this, I think, is are, are the interesting part, right? You're making certain technical trade-offs early in a product life cycle to get it in front of people to try to build a revenue stream, right? If you're thinking startup world, right? I mean, that's that's what you're doing, right? Is, you, is you're, you're taking on certain technical uh, limitations to get the code out faster. But then longer term, as you think about the maturity side of this is, okay, I made that trade-off early on and I took on some of that debt. I took, a, I took out a loan, right? But I have to repay it back. And the question then becomes is, you know, what additional things do I need to do to get past that maturity point where I can continue to grow it and it doesn't cause me money to support bad code that I put in place? I think it's a really good way to think about it because it is a money trade-off uh, yeah. when we think when we make these decisions. And, and what was interesting, so one, just to clarify there, that the point Ward was trying to make is he always wanted, pe he always wanted people writing good code, but just maybe the, the, the debt he was saying of accumulating was maybe not writing all the features or all the functionality or all that type of thing. So he wasn't talking about writing bad code. That that was the, the heart of the article. But um, the second part, um, what I want to say brings right into what you just said, Matt, which is a lot of people are realizing that, you know, there's always going to be that that sort of variance between engineer talk and management talk. How do you, our finance talk, right? If you, you know, if you need to make that case for, we need more time for this project. And I think that's where the, the use of the financial um, lingo, so to speak, uh, becomes really handy, right? Because that then they're able to understand or they think they understand on a dollar or cents what, what's going on and, and why you need that time. So I think from that point of view, there's there's value in it. No pun intended. <laughs> no, I think that's what's great. You know, for me, my first reaction to this article, it was a lot of paragraphs that just kind of boiled down to a well actually type of yeah. perspective. But um what I did like about it is the the history because you know and Ward Cunningham, you know, what was his insight, where did this come from? But also too, just as the way you two have been talking, you know, what what's a metaphor that helps with communication? And this way, just saying debt, and we can say technical debt, we can also throw in security debt as well well. Um, but that concept of debt that has to be either paid off at some time or forgiven at some time, or it just sinks you because you have allocated the economics of your engineering time, your security investments, you know, b basically time is an investment too. Um, that metaphor hopefully can help improve that conversation. So we say either do we really need to be supporting this old version of window you know this old windows 7 version or this old version of android or ios or can we actually take advantage of newer versions and just say because we have access to this particular type of api we can hook into a secure enclave and store secrets better or we can have access to better um uh i'm gonna say aslr that's pretty old or uh, i've just got my photo in my uh uh, compiler 
the acronym is backwards possibly. Um, but that's where I'm going with with that is that debt is actually something something really easy to talk about. And I will also say InfoSec loves metaphors, you know, everything going back to super highway and cars and all these metaphors of what security is like. A lot of them go off the rails quickly. Um, so I do like that debt is pretty quickly recognizable and it's, I, you know, it's easy to go off the rails or misuse it. Um, but I haven't seen that as much as I have other types of metaphors that have crept into security conversations. Well, it probably partially relates to, did that originate with, um, uh, from a marketing side of a house or from the engineering side of a house, or I should say product. Mm. Uh, so I think that probably has part of if it's really going to stick or, or not on that. And I think you're right with ASLR. <laughs> yes. It, and, uh, uh, John, I did do a quick search on Windows 7 and show Dan. There's there's still a few thousand devices Windows 7 on the internet, so we're past 50. You realize well, that every time we make... half of those are honeypots, though. So <laughs> you, have to, you have to realize every time we mention Windows 7, we're we're triggering the poor guys in in uh, in the um, uh, chat channel. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but no, but that, that, that's a good thing. And I, I, part of it, you know, we, we haven't pulled out a lot of history of InfoSec or history of tech articles. I, I, that's one of the things I would like to go back to. And I'll also be curious, too, for our listeners, you know, let us know what would be some, you know, what are the metaphors that you've actually found useful? So what are some positive ways to talk about and have those conversations with developers? Because we heard Judy sitting down to talk with developers and hand-holding them through and demonstrating how vulnerabilities are exploited to get that across. Cross. Um, that's a lot of time investment there to sit down with them with tools, demonstrate, but it's high value. Um, but are there other metaphors for conveying the risk? Um, or also, what are the metaphors that have a little bit gone off the rails and just haven't quite worked? And this, so those are the ones to avoid when trying to communicate security in an AppSec program that is working or not working to your executive level, getting VP buy-in, or even for those of you out there talking to boards. You know, how does, you know, what, what, what works and what doesn't? So this is that communication aspect that also kind of appealed to me from highlighting this type of article. Yep. So that brings us, yep, let's go ahead. I think, Matt, you were going to say something? No, no, I'm good. Ah, anything, any any other metaphors you want to drop off on us real quick, John? Anything you can think of at the top of your head just to put you right on the spot right now? <laughs> um, I'm I'm good. Uh, we had a few things in the backlog, <laughs> uh, but I think right now we're, we're at a good point. That, 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 that seemed like a pretty good one to end on, that depth cycle. That does. So, listeners, if you if you have some favorite metaphors, let us know. And um, the the interesting ones, the ones that get us thinking or, or get us possibly that could um, up on a soapbox and rant a bit in a in a constructive way. Let us know. Maybe we'll pull those in. And of course, if there's other news that comes up this week that you'd like to hear us talk about, give us some feedback. Listen, Drop into our Discord all, and and uh, all of you know, my rants yeah? are positive. All of my rants are positive. <laughs> they are positively rants. Absolutely, John. <laughs> excuse, excuse me interrupting you. Go ahead. No worries. Always great to have you, Matt. Always great to have you, John. Thanks for joining. Um, thanks for everyone listening, and thanks for everyone chatting in the Discord channel as well. Come join us as we live stream these. We'll say thank you once again, and we'll see you next week on Application Security Weekly. <laughs>